Our next Jaeger recipient is David Black of District 14. Teaching science at a liberal arts focused charter school has led David to take an integrated approach to science. He collaborates with colleagues across disciplines to ensure his students learn the science of art and the art of science and history of both, putting science concepts into a meaningful and motivational context. Thank you, David. Well, to begin with, I would like to say thank you to NSDA for this opportunity and also thank you to Dr. Yeager for his continuing efforts in, in science education. I'd like to, um, if you would, allow me to share one of my great passions in science teaching. I found that one way to engage students is to include art and history in STEM concepts. Of course, the first thing you're probably thinking is, why would you want to incorporate art and history into STEM? Doesn't STEM already have four subjects in it? Isn't that a lot already? Well, yes, that's true, but I'm not proposing that you use, that you teach all of art and history. Leave that to the art and history teachers. What we're going to do here is use art and history to reinforce and enrich specific STEM concepts. Now, um, I really believe that by doing this, you provide, by using art and history, you provide the historical context and the spark of creativity, problem solving, and concise communication that are so essential to STEM education. Art and history can make science and engineering truly come alive. Now the images you see on this page here are actually some uh, student created projects. Now most of these are from my chemistry classes, uh, but I also do similar things in my astronomy and, and other science classes that I teach. Um, the two top projects were actually made with homemade ink using a traditional recipe and drawn by students. And they also represent the history of chemistry. The one on the left is of Paracelsus. The one on the right shows uh, Spanish armor. Now, the illustration on the bottom left is, of course, of Schrodinger's cat, because I'm sure you're familiar with that. Now, the student that did this, she, she reasoned that since Schrodinger's cat is both alive and dead, it must be undead, it's a zombie. And you notice it's also munching poor Schrodinger's brains here. Um, the final image on the, on the bottom right is of our chemist tree. So, yeah, and so what I have my students do is actually pick a chemical element, they have to do some research of it, and then create an ornament, an elemental ornament, that represents that element, or some aspect or property of that element. And so you see some things in here, including uh, there's an element here that shows um, the space shuttle because it has beryllium parts like the brake linings. There's one here that shows um, a lump of coal, a bismuth crystal, and of course, Freddie Mercury. <laughs> In every case, the students demonstrate chemistry concepts mixed with a bit of creativity and humor, and I believe that through this process, they'll remember the chemistry better. I also believe that the teaching STEM with art and history is a holistic approach that, that mimics what we do in real life. I mean, when we're solving a problem, we use whatever skills we have gained from whatever sources to look at and come up with solutions to that problem. It's not like we take our days and say, okay, for the next 45 minutes, I'm just going to be a mathematician. That's just not natural. We, we do whatever we can using whatever skills we have to solve problems. Um, so why not have students learn in the same way that we expect them to live? Science is found in art and art in science. In fact, I propose that science is really the truest humanity. My wife, who is a humanities major, might disagree with me on that, but uh, I think it truly is. It's a truly a human process. It's a humanity. Take the example of Leonardo da Vinci. He's the prototype of the Renaissance man. So he's a scientist, he's an inventor, he's an illustrator, he's also a sculptor and a painter. Um, back in, in the kind of the middle part of da Vinci's life, he was employed by the Duke of Milan to create a huge bronze sculpture in honor of the Duke's father. Now this would have stood 25 feet high and just the amount of bronze to make it was staggering. 
Well, da Vinci sketched out how he was going to do this. He planned on making the bronze horse with a single pore of molten bronze. We still don't know how he was planning to do it. He was collecting the bronze to make this when, unfortunately, the French invaded Milan, and the Duke had to melt down the bronze to make cannons. So the horse was never finished, like many of da Vinci's projects. But 500 years later, it finally was finished, and there's a copy actually standing um, near the racetrack in Milan. There's also a copy in Grand Rapids, Michigan, that you can go see. That's the one you see down at the bottom. Um, imagine if we could turn our students into modern-day da Vinci's. Renaissance men and women. The other statues that you see here are bronze sculptures from a bronze foundry in Alpine, Utah called Adonis Bronze. And I took my students on a tour there this last fall, and you would be surprised how much chemistry and science there is in this art form. If you look at the horse on the, on the left-hand side, the upper left, you notice it has two different colors. Those patinas are created by using different chemicals on the bronze, let alone the entire history of the lost wax technique that's used for making these sculptures. It's still used. It's been around for over 2,000 years. They've added some modern wrinkles to it, but it's still essentially the same process that was used 2,000 years ago. Now, Students should construct their own meaning from our classes as we move them from passive to active to creative in the types of projects they complete. The best way to learn science is to be a scientist, designing experiments and collecting and analyzing authentic data. Science has meaning as you discover new ideas. Students also learn concepts more thoroughly if they become teachers. I mean, after all, who learns the most in a, in a classroom? It's the teacher because they have the most invested in it. So if we can have our students teach each other science concepts or even create science educational materials, then they're going to learn a lot from that. It will be meaningful for them. It, they will be invested in it. Now, let's get down. Uh, and, uh, there's a saying, I and mean, you've all heard this saying, you know, if you feed a man a fish, you feed him for a day. If you teach him how to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. But I would like to add one more thing to that. If you can train a man how to teach others how to fish, you just fed a village forever. Well, let's get down to an example. So uh, this last fall, I was talking with our biology teacher, and she mentioned that rabbit brush was used by Native Americans and pioneers to make a bright yellow dye. And you know, rabbit brush is a scrub brush that just grows in poor soils, you know, poorly drained on my dad's farm. I thought it was a useless bush. But doing a little bit of research, I found that his Latin name is Ericamaria nauseosa. For good reason, the blossoms have a nauseating smell. Um, also discovered that the stems and the leaves have 6% latex rubber in them, which means that's a very commercially viable thing if you could just figure out a way to extract it. And so I decided to do a little lab here of dyeing cloth using natural dyes. So we took a short field trip to a stand of rabbit brush about a quarter of a mile away from our, our school, collected the blossoms, and yes, they did smell pretty bad, especially when we started boiling them. And then, um, but the students had to take the, the dye and figure out an inquiry lab. In Utah, we have what are called intended learning outcomes, which include the nature and processes of science. And I thought this would be a good way of addressing that while doing chemistry and doing a little art and history. So uh, some groups decided to use the rabbit brush. Some decided to use walnut shells, which are very rich in dark brown tannins. Uh, one group decided to use cochineal that they ground up. If you're familiar with that, it's a dye used in a lot of uh, food products, and it comes from squashed bugs. So next time you drink a shake at your fast food restaurant and it's a strawberry shake, just think you're drinking bug juice. But it's true, so we, we took the cochineal, and what that group had to do also is figure out how to make a bright red color out of the naturally burgundy uh, carminic acid that comes from the cochineal. They also had to figure out how to, you know, what the procedure was, what variables to test, what variables to control, and then how to get quantitative data from this at the end. And what we decided to do was to take the, the swatches that we were using, different types of cloths, some natural, some synthetic. Some groups looked at, well, would, is a mordant a good idea? Mordant will help set the dye. What, what about using different temperatures of the dye baths or how long you put the, the fabric in the dye? 
Well, we took the fabric swatches and then scanned them on a flatbed scanner into a computer and used the eyedropper tool in Adobe Photoshop to get the RGB and the HSB values. Now, I teach media design, so I have you know, the software and the technology available to do this. And what we they, they, they did then was just compare those values to see which got the best yellow, you know, and then draw conclusions from that. And we went further and, and then started looking at, well, what's the history behind dyes? What are different dyes that were used? And uh, for example, indigo or matter root or carmine or some of these other dyes that are used, where do they come from? We also talked about the, the growth of the synthetic dye industry. I don't know if you're aware of it, back in 1856, Sir William Henry Perkin, shown here, when he was 18 years old in his home laboratory, accidentally discovered mauve or mauvine, which was the first synthetic dye. He was actually trying to create synthetic quinine, but <laughs> failed. But what was brilliant about him, Perkin was that he realized that this residue he was about to throw out when he washed it with alcohol had a bright purple color and said, hmm, this might be useful. So he abandoned his search into quinine and revolutionized the industrial chemistry industry. It's pretty amazing what he did. Okay, now there's many other possibilities of how we can use art and history to engage students in STEM education. Um, I just have a few listed here. Um, one of the things we do is we, we make homemade iron gall ink using basically a variation of Sir Isaac Newton's recipe. You see his recipe right here, and he wrote it with his own ink. We know that because it says at the bottom, I, made this I, made, I wrote this with ink that I made with this recipe. We've used some modern equivalents of it, but then the students test, well, how, if we use different amounts of these variables and, uh, and use different amounts of gum arabic as the binder, what makes the best dye? And what we're trying to do is get the, the deepest, richest black dye possible. If you fail in, in getting the recipe or don't get it right, it winds up being just kind of a weak sepia. We've also tried making our own watercolor pigment, pigments. You see some paintings we're doing here to test them out. And other things. For example, chocolate making. You'd be surprised how fascinating that process is. It's definitely a chemical engineering process. I mean, how do you get rid of the, the bitter tannins and the chocolate while keeping the very subtle flavor notes that you find in the gourmet cacao beans? And so we took a tour of a local chocolate factory and learned all about the chemistry behind it. And is chocolate really addictive? Well, that's an interesting question. So if you have a chance, um, I'd love to hear from you if you're doing something in the classroom like this. And I also have some other examples of what we're doing on my blog site here. I've got a couple of blogs. One is uh, Elements Unearthed, that's about chemistry. And then Spaced Out Class, that's about what we're doing in, in astronomy. And there's my email address. Please contact me. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you. <laughs>